and good afternoon to everybody out there. Um, and welcome to this, our second webinar called The Rise of Hotelization. Uh, we're excited to crack on with this emerging yet largely unexplored topic uh, within real estate with three fantastic panelists who certainly know their onions or reception desks, should I say. Uh, we'll meet them a little bit later. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Guy Windsor Lewis. I am the founder and CEO of The Locale Group, um, a digital property management company that began in 2005. And for those of you who don't know, we have three companies in the business now. Locale, which is property management and communication app. Life, which is our tenant engagement team. And Look, which is our digital content team. And all together, bringing clients a total management comms and enlivenment service. Um, just before we start on the actual webinar itself, can I just mention a few notes about housekeeping? Uh, just want to make sure that um, attendees are aware that they can send in their questions using the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. Um, and we will work to answer all the questions uh, at the Q&A segment towards the, the sort of the back end of the webinar. Um, and a, we will make a recording of this webinar available too. Um, Next one is the polls. Um, we'll also be running some polls throughout the webinar. So please do vote as this will only add to the conversation. Um, sadly, these are only available to those of us joining on Zoom, um, but the polls will remain open until we reach the poll segment um, of the webinar. So I'm just gonna get rid of that. Um, right, where are we? So in terms of the session overview, um, so for my part, really, so I haven't been part of the prop tech scene for sort of just over 16 years now, which seems like a lifetime. Um, we at Locale have witnessed many changes within building management um, and indeed occupier engagement, including the rise of hotelization, a term we first came across about three or four years ago at MIPIM. However, it's a notion that as I'm sure our panelists will tell us has been around for a lot longer than that where it morphed across from the hotel and hospitality worlds into first residential, I think, um, and now commercial space. Uh, we certainly began to see an influx of hoteliers and professionals with a hospitality background coming in to manage buildings, all sectors, um, about 10 years ago, making the whole physical and front of house welcome, more service focused, more occupier focused, and more like a hotel, um, which is where the phrase has come from. Slowly the momentum has picked up, other parts of the real estate sector began to adopt this philosophy, putting more focus and investment on front of house, leading to a far greater focus on customer experience and arguably the whole of the tenant app market. But it isn't just manifest in the way that we now treat our occupiers, it goes deeper into the way we use space. No longer are incoming tenants happy with long term leases, they want flexibility flexibility in the length of their leases, the amount of space they occupy, and the services they receive. The trick for the resi and commercial sectors is how do they provide the level of flex and service at cost-effective levels that still provide the same, if not higher, returns. To get the most of this topic, I've broken it down to three key themes. So we've got the origins, um, what it is, the role of technology, and also the trends that have arisen from service-led spaces. And after we've covered off these themes, we'll then discuss the results of the polls um, and before we dive into the Q&A side. So joining me on this webinar, we have a very esteemed panel of industry experts who will be providing their insights and experience into this unique topic. My job uh, is to grill them in a fair but entertaining manner, much like the way the select group grilled Mr. Cummings yesterday but I'll be more gentle and we won't take seven and three quarter hours. So without further um, ado, um, I would like the guys to introduce themselves and we'll start with Anthony, then Chris, then George. Anthony, over to you. Thank you, Guy. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Anthony Laser. I'm the head of commercial for Office Concierge. We employ front of house staff for premium office uh, and residential buildings and have a team of lifestyle managers providing value add services. Thank you very much indeed. Chris. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Chris Carter Keel. I'm the CIO of LifeX. Uh, we are a uh, co-living uh, brand with uh, over 400 beds across five cities 
uh, across Europe. Uh, we're based out of Copenhagen. Uh, we've been very much uh, oriented, we've been going for four years, oriented towards providing service and tech uh, in the residential uh, world. I've had 30 years of experience across commercial as well um, with people like uh, BNP Paribas uh, and latterly with Oxford Properties. So delighted to help out today. Good to have you, Chris. Um, and George, as I was saying earlier, um, our, our agnostic. Thanks, Guy. Like yeah, my, name's, yourself. my name's George Sell. I'm editor-in-chief at a company called International Hospitality Media. Uh, we are a publisher of three online B2B news sites for various facets of the hospitality sector, uh, namely boutique hotels, service departments and apart hotels, and vacation rental. Uh, we're also an events and awards organiser, and we are launching a new event in London next month called the Urban Living Festival, which is very much focused on the convergence of various hospitality and real estate asset classes. Um, and this hotelization issue is, is really core to that event. So I'm delighted to be here today. Thank you very much, George. Um, right, okay, I think let's just get straight on to the subject. So we've got three themes we need to do uh, or to cover. Um, the first one is really about the origins um, and I'd just be curious to, to hear your collective views on where did it all start? How did it first begin? Um, Anthony, do you want to take the, take the lead here? Sure. So from our perspective, um, whilst the term is quite recent, I think, as you mentioned, Guy, the, 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 what sits behind the term um, is something actually that we've been doing for, for over 20 years. I mean, our entire business was founded... Um, almost 19, 20 years ago, with this concept in mind, taking that some of the hotel style model and bringing it, as our name office concierge suggests, into that premium corporate office market where it's focusing on service, really. You know, so historically you had in uh, office buildings core of commissionaire or a grumpy security guard sitting on the desk. And there really wasn't this whole outsource front of house solution. So we were the, the first business in the space to, to start it. Um, and over the years, it's now grown. You know, we've got over 220 sites across across London. We're part of an international group as well. So it's very much something we, we saw in London, um, but it's now very much a global trend. And I think, you know, everything that has stemmed from that, from the events, the engagement, the lifestyle, comes from that, that origins of bringing that hotel style service into, into, the, uh, into the office space. And then residential, of course, is part of that as well. So Chris, you've got an experience of working in sort of more recently the, the resi side, but prior to that, um, for some pretty heavyweight um, commercial um, companies. Would you go along with that? Did you, have you seen this? Yeah, so I, I reckon the first time I saw it was when I uh, started at Oxford and had uh, Green Park at Reading as one of the assets that I had to look after. And I, it was a, um, literally 1.3 million square feet. Um, it had, you know, upwards of 5,000 people on the park. Uh, it had sort of 20, 30 occupiers in terms of corporate occupiers. And you have to try and find the way of, of keeping those people with you rather than going somewhere else and attracting those particular companies and people to your, your park. So I actually, you know, it, it's a tough job, but someone's got to do it. I went to California for uh, literally just over a week and had a tour around places like um, uh, San, San, obviously San Francisco, down into the valley, um, uh, and obviously looked at play, people like um, uh, Adobe, uh, and, uh, and at that time, uh, a, um, a couple of the, the, the sort of new startups like um, uh, Facebook, and, and uh, we went around the Googleplex, et cetera, and tried to look at what they were doing for their staff. And, and actually, that was where it all started for me, was how can you help occupiers attract and retain the best people and and that's where the hotelization came in and that they wanted those people to come in in the morning and not leave till they went and and then also leave with a good well-being set out so we bought um click and collect supermarket to green park which was the first one in the country we we looked at you know ways in which we could provide the best quality um catering to those people so that they actually just came away from their desk for a short period of time and then went back to the desk. Not, not perhaps the most hotelier scenario or well-being scenario today because the pandemic sort of changed everything. But in those days, it's moved in that direction where we provide more and more services and we provide more and more um, sort of quality to those, those staff and, and corporates. 
and the tech and uh, people bit is the key element to that. What bit do you do through tech and what be, bit do you do through people? So that's, uh, that was about 15 years ago. Interesting. Okay. And, and George, where, where have you seen um, the, the, the hotelization come into being? Well, I'm, I'm just going to give you a quick definition of hotelization before I go on to that, because that, that would be good. It's quite a neat one here. And it is the application of hotel type services and a hospitality service ethos to other real estate classes, such as offices and homes. We, you know, that kind of explains it in a nutshell. But I think hotelization is one facet of a bigger trend, um, which is essentially the beginning of the end of single use buildings, single use developments. And I think we're seeing a convergence of the best elements and the best practices from various different sectors and asset classes. So for example, the office world uh, and the build to rent world is borrowing from hospitality, but equally hospitality is having to change as well. Um, Anthony's um, analogy with the grumpy commissioner, uh, uh, you know, the grumpy concierge, who didn't make you feel particularly welcome. Well, you, you know, there, it wasn't that long ago, you got the same thing in a hotel. If you weren't a guest, you weren't made to feel particularly welcome. But now hotel lobbies are multi-use. People who aren't guests check in for a coffee and to work for an hour. So hotelization, I think, is one facet of, of this much wider convergence trend. And who, so who do you think was responsible for its growth then, for its actual, its move across? I mean, Chris, you were saying that you sort of saw individual companies we're trying to like Google and Facebook, whatever it is, we're, we're, we're providing those facilities and those services for their, for their staff. But where did it actually come across into actual sort of multi-tenanted buildings then for as a, as a, as a norm across across the resi and, and the office? Where or, or when? Where and when? We're still talking about origins, I guess. So it's like sort of the, 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 the starting, the sort of the, yeah. who, who actually lit that fire originally. So over here, Canary Wharf, I think, had quite a bit of an impact, you know, with the with the building of a completely new environment for commercial. You know, you saw, again, that mentality of trying to keep the people in the office building to get more efficiency out of them. Um, and, and ultimately, it was, as again, not very well-being orientated. It was merely trying to get more, more revenue out of them in terms of their days. So it, it was a little bit poorly... Uh, thought out, I, I think, probably for the longer term. But in the short term, it was right. You'll be there for 18 hours a day and I'm going to get my pound of flesh out of you. Right. If I could jump in and on, from yeah, my yeah. side, you know, I joined Office Concierge in 2012 when we started our, our Privé lifestyle division. So part of my role was to go to meet building managers and sell this concept of a lifestyle manager who would provide tickets and restaurants and, you know, event planning, very much like a hotel concierge, but into the into the office market. And in, back in 2012, it was a hard sell. You know, there was not a lot of interest. You know, really, we had it at Heron Tower. That was our first site where we launched it back in 2011. But, you know, it, it took a lot of convincing that, you know, there, there was a community to build, that there was value add. You know, it was still a traditional landlord uh, tenant relationship back then and, and i even, saw so even even going back to the start of office concierge then you said you started started 20 years ago so were, were, were people open to that idea so that was we, we used to do lobby services you know flowers and additional bits but really that added value for occupiers you know in terms of as the end user started in this, this project in 2011 2012 and that was a hard sell initially it wasn't until about 2014 15 where i saw a shift and suddenly i had, you know the building managers coming to us because there was a shift and i think the shift was down to us all as consumers having higher expectations. We all we all know what great service looks like, you know, when you go to a five-star hotel or a lovely restaurant and you get that 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 fabulous experience. I think, you know, that growth and that expectation, maybe with the changing demographic of occupiers as well, but also, you know, the highly competitive nature of the marketplace, you know, people need to do more, need to innovate more. So that shift I think happened, uh, you know, the last four, you know, five or six years from, from our perspective at least. I think when people are in multi-let buildings as well, you know, you, you have to get that. You, you are the face of the companies that are within that building. And whatever you say to the person who walks through the front door, if you don't have their pass ready or you, you, you know, all of the sort of real service stuff, it reflects on them. So that's why they then challenge the owner who then challenges, you know, yourselves to, to continue to improve that, that skill set. So do you think this has come from the tenants then, the occupiers? 
Yes. Okay, think, George, think, would you agree with that? Yeah, I think so. I think it's a, you know, it's a, it's part of a broader ten, trend in how people live today. So, I mean, if we talk about some of the amenities that are being included in office premises now, you're looking at, um, you know, F and B outlets, um, breakout areas, um, fitness centres, um, changing areas, showers, you know, bike parking. All all these things are reflective of the way the way people live now. And I think if uh, if an office tenant wants to attract the best talent to their organization then they're going to have to make sure that the office environment is what's expected from you know that from the very best people out there one of our think, offices has got a running track on the rooftop i mean that's kind of you know completely out there but it's a very tech you know young trendy development and uh, that's fitting for the kind of occupier it wants to attract uh, that's good i think it's in, it's interesting taking that theme from from our point of view being a sort of a, a software business really is that we've we've seen it really change from a, we've gone from a sort of a, a primarily a b2b company to a b2b to c company now as a lot okay. of other people in our space you, you're now dealing with not just the sort of the fms and the tenant reps but you're actually dealing with the end user and it's like, well, what, hang on, who, who, who brought them into the equation? Because 10 years ago, they weren't even a factor. They weren't even being acknowledged as something, you know, as a group, of, as a class of people, as a user group, that we should be, you know, sort of entertaining on this. And that's and, and, fundamentally changed it. Yeah. And turning that into the residential piece, of course, that's where moving, when my move from commercial into residential, you know, the demands of the C's are, are just so much more than they were of the B's. As far as the B's were concerned, as far as they were, con you know, they were very happy as long as they, they got a level of service. Now, where you live, you, we are responsible for creating the environments where they work, live, play, do everything. And that's a much more challenging tech solution that we need to find. So moving on to that then, into the technology theme. So how does tech then play a part in, in LifeX, for instance? So, so we, we are born out of tech. So the two guys who founded it were based in San Francisco. They were moving back to Denmark. They decided they wanted to find a way in which they could live in a style that they, they wanted. So they created LifeX, which has tech at its, at its sort of heart. So underneath it all, we have uh, digital contracts are all signed um, so that there's no need for, for people to actually you know, go out and, and send out contracts. They're all digitally done. Um, we have um, uh, obviously apps which enable people to discuss with us any of the issues they have. And those issues are then ticketed. And ult ultimately, as, as you have over here uh, with, with, with Locale, but you know, ultimately, there's a time frame within which they have to be um, dealt with. And, and that tech backbone enables us to then um, reduce the costs of operation on one side and focus our people who are the expensive element on the sort of customer experience. So it enables you to drive down cost and focus, I would suggest. And George, do you, do you see the rise of technology in terms of the, host, the, the hotelization side as well? Yeah, the absolutely. Hospitality generally, I guess. Well, we've we've seen particularly with built to rent developers in the last couple of years, they have been hiring um, staff with a hospitality background to um, to bring in programming and to help create a sense of community. Um, studies have shown um, that the more the more sense of community people feel, then the longer they stay. Um, I've got some numbers here actually. Um, People who know one other person in their building are 75% more likely to renew their tenancy. People who know two other people, this rises to 90%. And on the tech side of things, we've seen um, some of the built to rent guys be quite innovative. Some, some of the features that Chris mentioned, but also things like um, obviously virtual viewings, which at the moment are very important. Um, all the financial side, paying the bills, uh, et cetera, on an app. Um, some are doing uh, no deposit, um, no deposit move in, checking references via the app. And they're also allowing um, residents to communicate with each other with, you know, within the development, which, which fosters that sense of community. Before I come on to Anthony on that, I just, Chris, a quick question for you. So do you find, based on George's figures, that the more socially interactive your, your tenants are, your occupiers are, that the higher the retention rates? Uh, without a doubt, and the longer they stay. I mean, we're, right. we're sort of a, a mid-stay, I would suggest. Our average stay is about 11 months, and um, 
ultimately uh, where people build relationships. We've got a few of our, um, our, our family style apartments where they've built such a relationship that, that no one's moved. They, they literally love living with each other, so they stay there. Um, and that's the challenge for us is to build that community. So we have community, um, specifically community directed individuals who, um, you know, for example, we had a, a DJ set on uh, about uh, a month ago where so the whole of the, the sort of virtual uh, network of, of LifeX got together and had a, a sort of a, a party with this DJ set. We had you know various quizzes obviously we're all quizzed out now but um but ultimately we had lots of cooking together um building relationships it's just been spectacularly good that personal interaction has been key and and Anthony coming, coming back to office concierge then how, how do you use tech and do you find the same sort of retention levels for tenants is increased because of that that social interaction through technology yeah, definitely. I think the interesting thing is, you know, it started very much from the residential space, I think, where it was ahead of the office uh, side of things. And we've got a number of residential developments and there. A big part of it is, is fostering that sense of community, as you mentioned, where residents can set up their own little social groups and upcycle and uh, organically create running clubs. And that's where you really build this, this natural sense of community. Um, so that's been going on now for a number of years. Moving that into the office space has taken a little bit longer, but actually it's a massive key driver and technology is the key to that because, you know, we've been pushing, you know, events, lobby events. We've done a million different types of things from cinema screenings to gin tasting, but ultimately you were reliant on an occupier signing up to a mailing list and giving their email address to be able to communicate with them through apps and technology, you have the ability to send push notifications, event invites, and actually create this, this hub. So from the occupiers in the office side, you know, it's massively helped in terms of that engagement, but technology has also been massive in terms of the visitor experience, you know, QR codes as you're on arrival, you know, instead of our receptionist typing in names and who you're here to see, you know, they've already got that information. It's a QR code, it speeds things up. And then that gives them that time to focus on the customer service have a seat can I get you a drink and that's the thing that adds value and suddenly they're like they've got a great experience that stickability that retention of occupiers is a KPI we can get measured against and absolutely the technology is a key part of that of, of helping us deliver that now and George do you do you find there is now just an expectation generally that there's going to be some basic level of tech in either office or, or home environment yes and I don't think it's um exclusive to younger demographics either i think even, even that was my in, next question even in the senior living sector you know um uh, operators there are hiring hospitality professionals and they're also using tech to create this community links and actually um that generation are pretty adept at it and they spend a lot of time on social media they're very comfortable using apps um so yeah i think it is an expectation across the age ranges i think it's also just fair to say that um the operational uh, real estate investment world is the largest growing area of the market for investors. So if we want to take it right the way up the food chain to where the money comes from, they're looking for people who operate with these things in mind. Um, and, and, you know, ultimately, that's what we're all here to, to provide is the best risk adjusted returns that provide what our occupiers want, and what our investors want. And it's that balance between the two. So, I'll just, um, yeah. I'll just take it one step further in terms of the future is that actually now, you know, going forward, it's about building that technology into the design of the buildings, you know, rather than retrofitting it afterwards, which is obviously something that's had to be done with new speed lanes. It's looking at the internet of things, you know, that's the future in terms of smart building, smart technology. Um, and that's the expectation going forward. For sure. Are you, are you having that conversation with your with your landlords then, Anthony? Um, I'd love to be having the conversation. Some of them <laughs> uh, we get brought in a little bit too far down the food chain, but uh, you know, Funny, certainly, it? yeah, it's annoying, and it's the same in residential buildings when they like build the the lobby area and they're like, oh, there's nowhere to store any parcels. It's like, how can we run the space? Um, but you know, it's it's absolutely that some are doing it and some are retrofitting, but it, it is very much on the on the future. The, the more we can get ahead of that 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 build 
and, and lead time and build these things into it, the better the service will be as an output. And that's where hotels are great because it's a complete design where they're building every element of service delivery. They're thinking about the service corridors and room service and how things work into the design. Whereas with, I think historically in office and residential buildings, those things are sometimes an afterthought. So maybe that's been a few years, Chris, but would you agree with that? Yeah, so I think you know that's where I was just suggesting that the operational investment, uh, real estate investment world is is going to be key. So bringing Anthony in when the developer is developing the building, thinking about the the infrastructure, thinking about the backbone, enabling that sustainability opportunity as well to come out right at day one, I think are all absolutely essential. And and I think investors are becoming more. I would say you're, you're seeing a, a, a diversification, a, a, a move away from uh, investor operators in a way, and that investors are now becoming reliant on uh, developers, asset managers, et cetera, and being asset allocators rather than being actually in it day one. So maybe that's the whole thing is that the operational investment environment leads to being more interactive with Anthony and, and, and others in order to make sure you get the right property when you finish. It's, it's got to be a partnership, but you've got to be doing it together. Otherwise, yeah. if you're two parties working separately, it doesn't work. Yeah. Um, so we're just going to move on to our, our sort of final theme here, trends. And George, I'm going to come to you if I may. So one of the things that's, that's obviously interested us all over the last 15 months is the office v. home um, sort of argument. Um, so how do offices compete with, with, with a sort of working from home situation in, in sort of the... I'll go back to the pre-COVID and the post-COVID sort of uh, scenario? Um, well, I, I think looking to the future, I think um, a lot of us are getting pretty fed up with looking at the same four walls every day. And there is a definite will to return to the office now. I, I don't think five days a week, nine to five is going to be the, the model for most people now. Um, we've talked to lots of people about this and currently the most common um, scenario seems to be perhaps three days in the office, two days working from home or that, that kind of balance. Um, the fact that we have all been working from home for so long will probably mean that office design and office management will probably change to incorporate a more home-like ethos, but, you know, in terms of design, furnishing space. I, I suspect there will probably need to be more space per employee um, so, so fewer, um, fewer employees um, per, per floor. Um, in terms of um, working patterns, I think that might change as well, because I think although people want to get into the office, I think the thought of getting on a commu crowded commuter train or a tube or a lift, um, that still could be an issue for some people. So I think staggered working hours will, will probably be different. Um, and I think, um, yeah, I think... The provision of hospitality like services in terms of F&B, in terms of a place to go and step away from your desk and relax, um, even have a, have a workout, do a yoga class, whatever it is people do. Um, I think those are going to be increasingly important and I think they make people more productive too. Anthony, would you agree with that? Yeah, for sure. I mean, we've been doing rooftop yoga and uh, well-being classes for office occupiers for, for many years now. And I think, you know, when people were spending five days a week, eight, nine, 10 hours, 12 hours a day in their offices, that kind of on-site facility was, was really beneficial. Now with this definite move to three, four days a week working you know, in the office, two days, one day working from home, you know, people will be able to fit things like that around their own personal lifestyle. So I think we've progressed 10 years, you know, COVID's made a massive impact in terms of companies realizing you can work remotely which i think on a well-being level each for us individually is going to be really positive um however our our, our clients our landlords the, the agents we've got a battle on our hands we've got to try and encourage people to bloody come back to the offices you know it's actually not we, we can't take it for for granted that you know some new companies are saying you never need to come back so that has an impact in terms of the retail in those areas it has an impact in terms of the the community that those buildings created um so we have to encourage Encourage that. So how do we do that? Well, technology is a key part. You know, is there offers, retail partnerships, discounts, make it a, uh, you know, as you arrive on Tuesday, maybe you can order your coffee and it's there at the coffee shop ready for you. If we make all these things effortless, people will return more, but we actually have to do a bit of a PR campaign and drive service uh, and can't take it for granted anymore. On the residential side, 
our concierge have been never busier than ever because everyone's at home. So yeah, they've said yeah, uh, yeah. they've been dealing like Christmas Day parcels every day for the last for the last 14 months so you know those guys a need a little bit of a break get people back to the offices but the expectations on service are, are higher you know what people expect in their residential environment um and, and they're paying for it they're paying a service charge that they, they want service and uh you know we're, we're there to deliver it but i think technology has to support us with that because otherwise these things just aren't efficient and you know if you have too many staff the, the service charge often can't take it so efficiency uh, and seamless service to the court so what just that you mentioned the retail there and i'm sure chris will come in on this so what happens to the the, the in-house retail that that need five days of of footfall going through to make it profitable so do all these all these small retailers become subsidized by the landlord and so they're losing money before they even sort of get out of bed what happens to those guys or or is that a, an unwritten yeah, well, I think if you, if you look around the retail around Liverpool Street and the city at the moment, it's struggling. You know, it's a ghost town. That's the guys outside, let alone the guys inside. And they're facing the same problems. I think the internal retail has always been a little bit of a struggle. Um, it's got, it, sometimes it's a winning formula, works very well. Other times it, it doesn't. It depends on the operator there. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, you've got to look at cutting costs. You know, it's not going to be the same number of footfall no. as historical ever. You know, I can't see us ever returning to pre you know march levels in buildings at all so yeah it's going to be a more competitive landscape they maybe things have to be run more efficiently or subsidized if the service is is is, is part of the the pitch of that building um mm. but, you know but we know that the best places um will be busy you know if anyone's tried to book a, a you know restaurants over the last few weeks like we do for many of our our you know on the lifestyle side they're all full up you know so people want to gather people want to get together people want to return um yeah. so there is the demand there it's just got to be a bit more competitive and, and, and managed appropriately. And yeah. Chris, where are you on this then? Well, I, I think Anthony's right. I mean, I think, you know, uh, there's a balance between the efficiencies that we gain from remote working and the benefits of the social interactions and creativity that, that you know, work, meeting people in person generate. Um, so I think, you know, we have to try and find that balance. But um, as Future Forum say that only 40% of people can actually work from home. So, you know, you've got 60% are the people involved in all what Anthony was just saying, which, you know, they, they are the people that provide the transportation, the retail, all of the things around us. So we have to bear in mind that, you know, it, it, it is a decision that's being taken by that 40% that influences everything else. Um, so I think, I think what we're going to find is that people will uh, continue to evolve their virtual uh, office and they will you know continue to evolve their their their, their technology uh, they'll they'll also have to look at their culture because one of the things that has come out of the pandemic you know whilst that there are some a couple of positives that Anthony pointed out you know the cultural things are, are also really important for your business to get right because unless you are able to bind that community of people together you won't get the most the best out of them um, so I think it, and, and George mentioned it earlier, it, it's about creating the right environments for the human experience to thrive. That, that's obviously the key to all what we're trying to do here. And that's office, home, and all, all the points in between, the third spaces which used to be referred to as. George? Yeah, I'd just like to ask the other panelists actually what they think will happen in terms of, of um, leases and flexibility of tenants because if, um, if demand for office space is down, um, then organisations looking for office space are going to be more demanding. And I'm just wondering how that is going to be reflected in the terms that they're offered by, uh, by office space providers. But I think you, you mentioned one thing, which is that actually the amount of space that they will use is going to be um, reduced, but not that much reduced because they'll need more space per person in order to reflect the, the, the greater um, diver, uh, you know, social distancing. Um, but I think, you know, in terms of the, the flexibility, which we've talked about right at the beginning of this guy mentioned flexibility, everybody is demanding more and more flexibility. And the only way owners can deal with their risk on the amount of avoid, et cetera, they've got is by the stickability that we've talked about the whole way through. So services are gonna become much more important in order to, 
tie those people in and ultimately deliver what the, the people and the businesses need. So it's a, it's a completely uh, inward looking circle. Everyone is responsible for maintaining the levels of risk and therefore everyone is maintaining the level of occupancy and services provide that. So I think, yeah, we're all on the right track. Yeah, I've got, I've got uh, one more question on this theme, but just to remind everybody um, watching this, if you can um, complete the polls, because that's the, the next um, topic we're going to come on to. So if you can um, go have a look at the polls, make your vote, and then we'll close them down, then we'll address those um, uh, after after this. So my, my question is, is who, who is it beholden to? Is it the agencies, or are, are they spineless and powerless in this game? Is it the landlords who've got to pull their finger out and actually do something to get them in and realise that actually... As Chris is saying, it's a blend of everything, a bit of resi, the whole, you know, the rise of the mixed use scheme is actually the way forward to get people back in. I think just picking up with the, with the landlords, and we've got many landlords that we act for directly as well. Um, you know, it's all well and good looking at mixed use. That's, you know, for future planning. But there's a lot of assets there that they've got to try and maximise. And I think on the office side, talking about the downsizing potentially of spaces, I think there will be a lot of movement over the next three to five years as some of those long term leases come up. And I think what all the landlords I know already were looking at before COVID is having a diverse portfolio. There will still be traditional companies who want their own office space on a, on a fixed lease and, and, and make it their own and have their own meeting rooms and their floors, etc. And then there'll be some that want, you know, that kind of more fluid model. And I think any investor will want a diverse portfolio with, with elements of both within it. Um, and they're all looking, you know, doing their own models of the, the, the WeWork or Office Group, et cetera, um, within their own portfolios to accommodate that because they become incubators. You know, the small companies that take up that small space grow within them and then take up the more formal space. So I think that there's lots of different kind of plug and play models uh, that, that, that landlords are looking at the office space. But I think you've got to try and make sure that these mixed use have schools, hospitals, you know, medical facilities, you know, residential, retail, you know, actually people talking about new developments, having everything like your local village all within one. So there's no longer uh, the requirement for car usage, for example, if everything's on your doorstep, that's got all the, the CSR and environmental piece, which is also a big thing we haven't really touched on today, that is a massive driving force in terms of change as well. Um, and we're seeing a lot more now in terms of the metrics that, 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 that landlords and managing agents are looking for is how do you prove that that CSR and how do you look at that, that social value add um, and the data that the technology can bring can help drive that. So that's a really important new trend. Do you, do you find, and George, I'm going to come to you on this as the sort of the, the agnostic in the room, is do you, do you find this is sort of demographic base? So you've got the sort of the, the young ones coming back into the city, the young couples wanting to be part of the, all the noise and, the, and the, 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 the energy and everything else and the sort of the slightly sort of more middle-aged, older ones sort of gen gently moving out to the pastures. I'm not looking at you, Chris. <laughs> um, I'm thinking more of myself, really, um, um, and just sort of mo moving out into the pastures and sort you've of. You've just moved you know, back in, though. <laughs> I, I have just moved back in. Yeah, that's true. Um, in but, in um, general terms, I think yes. Um, I, you know, I think for for younger people who are perhaps living in shared accommodation and have spent the last fifteen months potentially working on a laptop on their bed, yeah, I think they're absolutely desperate to get back in, um, but but not exclusively so. Um, and, and touching on the the the, uh, the ESG piece, um, you know the energy performance of, of, of buildings and so on, um, that is going to be important to a younger demographic in terms of choosing where they work. Um, in hospitality, it's actually not particularly driven by the guest. I think that the the real impetus behind behind all that um, is coming from the investment community again. I think that's almost as important as the bottom line now to investors. Um, and I think that's gonna make a massive impact on building design uh, and operations across every asset class. I think that's, uh, that's huge. Interesting. Okay, um, right, are we re ready to see the polls, the results? I think Caitlin, who's pulling the strings in the background is uh, hopefully gonna show us, or, or maybe it's me. Oh, there we go. Hopefully everyone can see those. Um, so the first, and this is a discussion discussion thing for, for you guys. Can everybody see that? Have you heard of fertilization before? So 72% yes, uh, and, and 28 either no or not until this webinar. So thanks for coming along, guys, because that's really good. Um, are you surprised by that? Bearing in mind, we probably got a pretty sort of real estate 
um, audience here? I think it's just referred to as many different things. I think the word hotelization is is obviously a, a bit of a sort of mash together. And as as I think you know, we were seeing in the property week or so it's the evening standard, the different people call it different things. I think it's a question of services, flexibility, and sustainability. You know, coming together in one word. Yeah, uh, it's a pretty it's a pretty hot topic. Uh, you know, with with that article coming out yesterday, so it's um. It's, I agree, it's, and there was a, there was a very good C, C, CBRE report on the, from the Asia Pacific guys about two years ago on it as well, which um, was quite interesting in terms of this this has to be the way forward. Uh, Anthony, this is definitely one for you. Would you ever recruit someone to come and work in your team with, with who hasn't got a hospitality background? Yeah, absolutely, and we do all the time. It's it's about attitude and personality. You know, certain clients, yes, historically say, oh, we need someone with a five-star hotel background. Fine, we used to do that. But actually, if you've got the right attitude and personality with our training and support, you know, anyone can, can move into hospitality space. And I think, you know, that there's definitely a career path there for, for anyone who, who who's not coming it. So lots of vacancies at the moment. Come apply for a job at Office Concierge. <laughs> Thank you for that shameless plug. Um, uh, the shift to service focused space, a direct results of technology providing the end user with more control. Chris, do you want to answer that one? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think uh, everybody, as I said, needs to have more control these days they, of their, their, their sort of lives because of the fact that they're trying to be in many different places and, and you know, um, balance many different projects. Um, and, and I think that if technology can, as I said earlier, can take the cost of that down and enable people to focus on the bits that are important to them, where the people need to be, then I think that will you know, lead on to this. And I think people are agreeing with that. So there, there is a huge sort of surge at the moment in sort of commercial space, which I'm sure um, you guys are all aware about, which, which basically means that you can sit in a room and you can play with the lights and you can turn the heating up and down. And I was talking one to one client the other day who was saying basically, Surely it's got to be better for you just to get up and turn the switch <laughs> off or, or go to the, the console, the panel on the, on the side of the room and actually do that rather than sit there and do it on your app. It, it's, it's the other one around that is that, that when you walk into the meeting room, it plays your, your favourite song. What happens if, you know, you've got different tastes of music from the other person that walks in? But the, on that, the, the, the smart building things I think is really important is around temperature control. Yeah. Um, you know, we've always had these issues in buildings that, you know, some people get too hot, some people get too cold. So if you can localise that, that temperature piece, that's a key issue that I think the, uh, the smart buildings can overcome with, with the right infrastructure. And I, and I think also something that we, we, we've, we've introduced to our sort of, sort of range of functionality is the sensor, so the air quality as well, which is an absolute key, and, yeah. and, and density, so numbers of people in, in the building, in the rooms, that sort of stuff. Yeah, the, heat, the heating thing is a perennial issue, isn't it? I mean, the, the problem that you know, is, is you can't have one person being warm and the person who sits just next door to them being cold. Um, you know, that, that, to pick George's point, if people are spread out a little bit more, then maybe it is possible to be more discerning on your temperature. But if you're warm and the person next door is cold, it's really hard to, in any tech that's there at the moment. Yeah. Uh, what is more effective at building stronger occupier relationships? So technology, customer service, a bit of both. Well, I think we always knew it was going to be customer service. I'm assuming that the only person that voted for technology would be our very own Dan, who's our CPO. <laughs> so Dan, if you're out there, thank you for that vote, um, holding the end up. Um, and do you think the pandemic has stunted or supported the growth of hotelization within real estate? George, do you want to comment on that one? So the majority think it's supported the growth. Yeah, I, th I think... Um... In terms of adoption of, of um, technology, it, it definitely speeded that up. Um, you know, we, we've seen that come from from the hospitality side of things. P people um, were very keen to have as little contact with staff as possible. They were looking for self-contained accommodation units, which is why service departments and apart hotels have outperformed every other asset class over, over the pandemic. Um, but in terms of the kind of the, the community element and the programming and the activities that uh, that obviously has been stunted because it hasn't been possible um but i think we're going to see a real surge in that and you know probably from next year onwards as, as things settle down and chris what does your pipeline look like for the next 18 months then uh in terms of new new beds uh well in, we in are... terms of interest i guess in terms of so if we're saying that 
the hotelization within real estate is, is growing, people want more of the sort of stuff that you're putting out there. Yeah, I mean, I think you know, what we're, we're doing is transitioning a little from our traditional model, which was smaller um, houses and apartments into blocks, um, but trying to keep that family style element within the blocks in some form, because that it's that br that breeds the community piece. So, and also also enables us to bring in technology from day one, because as I think we were saying earlier, to retrofit technology is a nightmare. Um, so I think overall our pipeline is gonna be larger uh, divided blocks. So we will divide them into, into you know, large apartments, et cetera, and have micro apartments where people can enjoy some of the amenities across the whole block. So it's gonna be more diversification. Yeah. I got, I got to agree with that. And, and the last one there, uh, Anthony, probably one for you. Are you surprised by that in terms of which sector do our, does our um, audience most associate hotelization with, commercial or residential? Um, it probably says more about the audience than, I guess, any particular trend, yeah, I enough. think. But I think, uh, you know, it's been there in residential for a while. We've seen a massive growth in commercial over the last couple of years, even before COVID, but I think COVID's really driven things forward with that, that contactless technology, that desire to, to make it, uh, you know, environmentally, uh, you know, hygienic, et cetera. Um, but we're also part of an international group, you know, and we're looking at trends, you know, it's called Armonia, we're in France and Spain and Dubai, and, you know, these things are happening all over the world. It's not just a UK based phenomenon, um, but I think a lot of this hotelization in the residential comes from Asia. And, you know, the original Asian market where, you know, this has been going on now for 20 years. So th there are international trends that are supporting behind this. And I think, you know, it's just we're now got the, the, the partners in the UK like Locale. But there's unfortunately for you guys, there's a few other competitors on the block and there's a lot more new emergence into that space, unfortunately. So it's become a bit more competitive. But, um, you know, I think having an app is key as well you know everyone being able to download that and i think that's something that um introduces it to both residential and commercial users as the end end user i would just say just um people should look up something called neom n-e-o-m which is a, a development in saudi arabia and it sort of brings together all of the technological and sustainable uh, innovations, whether it gets built, but you know, um, Saudi Arabia put $500 million into this already. And it's a 170 mile stretch with 17 cities in it, allegedly. But all of the traffic's underground and all of the developments are gonna be fully sustainable. And they think it will be not only carbon neutral, but it'll be carbon negative. So these are the sort of developments that are being, you know, heralded out there. Wow. George, what do you know about that? Um, nothing, but I'm going to go and have a look. It sounds incredible. <laughs> Funded by uh, lots of oil that's been dug up, of course. <laughs> well, but, uh, you know, you know, say, park yeah. that to one side. But uh, no, you know, the future city planning piece is key. And I think, you know, in London, we've got lots of green spaces, which is great. But, you know, in part of these master plans that so many developers are looking at, and I think in a similar way, you know, we've got to look at just more than the individual development, the wider area. Um, is key and I think planning is key around that as well in terms of you know making sure there's the right developments with the right mix and the right areas um, you know as things change which they will. Okay um, we're just going to move on to a few questions for the last sort of section of this so first one we've got is do you think priorities from managing agents are better aligned with those of building occupiers by following the hotelization approach? Who wants to take that? Uh, yeah, I'm happy to. Um, okay. Yeah, it, it, absolutely. I think, you know, placing the, you know, they used to call them tenants or occupiers. Now they're often referred to as customers or, you know, guests, you know, placing the end user at the heart of the actual service delivery and the vision, um, you know, is, is increasingly core. Well, it's been now a few years for the, for the agents and the management of the building. And that's a benefit to everyone because uh, a happy end user, uh, you know, provides a better service and that stickability point that we mentioned earlier. Uh, next one we've got is what kind of services can buildings offer to better enhance the experience of occupiers and meet their expectations in 2021 and beyond, I would guess, such as outdoor space? It's a good question. Who wants to answer that? George, why don't you have a crack at that one? Um, yeah, outdoor space obviously is in increasingly important to people, especially those who have been cooped up um, for the last 15 months 
Um, obviously, in cities like London, where real estate is very expensive, it, it's a it's a real balance for a developer to to come up with the optimum mix of, of um, you know u- usable, lettable space uh, and outdoor space. But it is more important to people. Um, you only have to go to somewhere like Soho Square on a sunny day in the summer, and you, you're lucky if you can find a blade of grass to sit on, and it, you know, which shows you how much how much people want it. Um, other services, I think, are, that, that are important are the ones that are perhaps peripheral to the to the to the core office let. So, have we, as we've mentioned, um, somewhere to eat and drink somewhere to meet a friend, somewhere to exercise. Um, some buildings even have, you know, entertainment facilities, um, screening rooms. Some even have, you know, show, you know, have live music shows, this kind of stuff. So, um, yeah, I, I, I think the office is going to have to get broader to, to attract, the, the, attract the best tenants. It's, it's fair to say that the soft services can be introduced quite quickly. Um, but it's the, it's the physical things like gyms or conference suites or, you know, as, as Anthony was saying, sort of a running track on the roof. I mean, that, that doesn't happen overnight, does it, Chris? You can't, you can't just magic that up in, within, within a couple of months. And, and also, w- within a year or two, and call me the, call me the skeptic, but, you know, in, in 18 months' time, once we've gone back to normal and, and hopefully all that will happen, are people, is this, is this just going to become a, a bit of a memory and we'll all just sort of dribble back to the offices and go back to that sort of five-day-a-week stuff and the landlords will go, well, never really did do anything any, anyway. Yeah. Well, that's obviously something that's happened in the past, but um, I, I, I don't think so. I, I think I think it really has changed. I think people are now seeing how their lives are, are different. Um, and I think, you know, it is about just providing that space and that uh, technological backbone that enables these trends to, to, to change and pivot. Because I think that, you know, today's Zumba class might be tomorrow's, uh, you know, whatever, another class that we haven't even thought of yet, which uh, will help us sculpt our beautiful bodies, Guy. Um, but, you know, I think the, the, bottom, the bottom line is that it, it is about providing space as a service, and that's what we're here to do. And, and it's providing that flexibility, which technology gives us. So the backbone of the technology is the key to providing diversity going forward. Fair enough. I think you've already answered the next question, but um, we'll ask it anyway from, from Don. What hospitality services solutions are here to stay and what are passing fads? So obviously you're not a keen fan of Zumba. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that a lot of the technology that's been adopted um, will, is here to stay. Um, there was uh, you know, a peripheral industry, but there was, a, there was a survey that came out today which said that 95% of restaurants that have introduced um, app-based um, ordering and uh, menus and so on uh, will carry on offering that service even even when you know they're, they're able to, to go to how they were operating pre-pandemic. Um, I think people have got used to doing more from their phones, more with apps. Um, I think um, you know that's the way people live these days. I can't see that changing. Um, and probably sort of the second last question is how important is hotelization to future proofing real estate? So do we think it's a, a, a key building block now or? Yeah, I think if I just go back to that design point, really, I think, you know, in terms of building this into the concept will, you know, will, will make a building last longer. You know, ultimately, a lot of you look at the last five, 10 years, landlords have had to invest money to update their buildings because they haven't made those considerations. So the more you look ahead and you build that technology and that, that service vision into the design, um, the more, you know, that, 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 that asset will be retained and, and, and enhanced over time. And it's interesting, isn't it? Because I, I certainly over the last sort of 15 years, I've seen, I've seen the landlords get more and more involved. I mean, I wouldn't say they were sort of almost sort of not interested in, in, in their buildings or whatever it was, but... Well, they used um, to just but, kind of sign the lease, give the well, key, see you exactly. later, bye, and, you know, see you in 10 years. And what have you, but, but yeah. these days they seem much more hands-on. Chris, would you, would you second that? Uh, yeah, I, I would. I think the, the definition of a, of a landlord is, is important here. You know, as I said, I think capital generally wants to give, um, enable people who are going to provide the services that are required by their by their occupiers. Um, so I, I think 
you know, we're seeing a, a, almost a, um, a split in who the landlord is. You know, you still have asset managers, you have fund managers, you have property managers. And I think getting that definition right as to who's doing what within the zoo is really important um, in order to deliver what the occupier needs. So, um, yeah, I think that's where I would and say. Do you, and do you think that should come from the occupier? Um, so one of our last questions is, is how important is occupier insight into this? Do you think that, that should be driven by the occupier or do you think, you know, that the landlord should be determining the way forward? No, definitely it needs to. I think, you know, what I struggled with when I was at Oxford was actually getting the, the, the sort of combined view of the occupier, I would say. So I, I tried to join some, some forums and some occupier, you know, um, committees, et cetera. And, and you know, we, we did all of these sort of things to try and get their understanding. But there's such a mistrust between owners and occupiers or landlords and tenants that, you know, they, they, I hope that that's coming now in the direction that we're all talking about, where, you know, hotelization is going to drive owners to realize that if they engage more, they'll get happier occupiers and they'll drive longer term commitments from them in terms of rent and service charge and, and grow with them within the, the environment they're in. My, my view is the landlords need to have the vision. You know, they can take data from different buildings and different demographics within buildings, but there's so many, such a variety of opinions, you know, for them to say, like, I want to invest in this. I want to make that roof terrace space. I want to bring in a really cool, um, you know, gym area or climbing wall in the building or running track. And, you know, those are things that uh, they're going to lose on rent yield from. You know, so they, but they've, they've got to be the ones to take that decision themselves because ultimately they're going to lease the space quicker or get a higher rent and have that stickability. But they've got to be, I don't think occupiers think about it. It's more build it and they'll come. You know, I think that's the way I think about it. But they do have to get some insight from, from experience, from other buildings, what's worked well yeah. and what's not worked well. And I, and I completely agree. And as Chris will know, because I've, I've harassed, knocked on his door and off and off over the years on this one, they, that in order to do that, they've got to have the data. And they don't have enough building blocks within their portfolios to give them that basic data. So you're in this sort of, you know, this sort of vicious circle, really, of saying, yeah, that's what they've got to do. And they've got to make the decisions. But they don't have the data to make the decisions. They don't have that information. And yet. the trends change. You know, if in terms of a planning for a building, you know, it's going to take five, seven, eight years before the, the ideas to development. Well, trends completely change in that time. So yeah, yeah. You know, it, it, it's, it's kind of hard to use the data to predict, you know, a trend yeah. seven, eight years down the line. That's very true. With the Leadenhall building, it, it yeah. took 13 years to get the Leadenhall building through to actually having been completed. And by that stage, the it, you know the the idea of having uh, bicy bicycle parking, we just didn't have enough bicycle parking in the Leadenhall building. You know, it was because it wasn't designed at that time. Yeah, I think we had a hundred. We had 120. If Dan was here, he'd tell me um, spaces for the shard. Mm -hmm. So you got six yeah. six thousand occupiers, 120. Uh, spaces for it. I mean, it's, it's, but that was you know, built in 2012 or 2011 and designed in whenever it was. Well, I think bikes is an interesting one about transport is key as well about how people get to work. And, you know, obviously, I think post COVID, there'll be a lot more people, you know, it's been growing over the last few years cycling. But how do you make that effortless, you know, a bike concierge service? Can you see that how many spaces available through the app and technology? So there's a lot we can do to encourage people to use those more greener, uh, cleaner ways of transport as well. And I think technology has got a big part to play there. OK, I think we've got a, a, a minute or two to wrap up. So literally 30 seconds. George, so hotelization, good thing, bad thing, got a future in all our lives? Yeah, I think it's a great thing. And I think um, just to take it away from the office for, for a second, I think, you know, if we go more to the residential side, whether it's built to rent, whether it's co-living or, or senior living, um, I think all the, all the things that have come in so far, you can't take that back now. That's going to become expected. That's a given. So you're only going to see more layers of hotelization going forward, I think. Yeah, I agree. Chris? You're just going to see more and more investors coming into the operational world. And, and that's where the growth is going to come. Um, and more I, service. And, more, and that will lead to more service, exactly. Yeah. And Anthony, so it must be happy days for you guys then. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's a core and every part of our business is about that world-class service and adding value and driving standards. So, you know, this growth is obviously something, as I said, we've noticed over the last few years, going back to the core of the business, but it's hugely welcomed. And, you know, I think having the people 
people is also key behind it as well I, I you know you need the people to drive that uh, and, and the technology supports them but um you know so guy lots of future projects and collaborations uh, off the back of those we've done already over the last few years hopefully i'm looking forward to it um right panel thank you very much indeed audience thank you very much for attending um and uh love you and leave you have thanks, a good everyone. rest of the afternoon all right cheers, cheers guys everyone. bye guys thanks guys bye. Bye.